Hi again, everyone. It's David Thompson with Civil War Monitors Behind the Lines. I'm joined today by Dr. William Link. Dr. Link is the Richard J. Milbauer Professor of History at the University of Florida and the author of the recent work, Atlanta, Cradle of the New South, Race and Remembering in the Civil War's Aftermath, which is now out with the University of North Carolina Press. So, Dr. Link, thanks so much for taking some time with us today. Well, thanks a lot for having me. Um, Atlanta is a, is a fascinating city, really one that reborn from the ashes. And I think uh, you tell a new story here. And what is the fascination with Atlanta? Why is Atlanta so unique? Um, well, I think Atlanta uh, was a place that, well, to start with, Atlanta was a place that was remade by the Civil War. And um, almost uniquely, I think it um, it experienced this huge boom during the war and uh, became such a crucial location um, as a city and as a center of a Confederate um, war effort in the Deep South, probably the most important city. Um, and the war transformed it. So it, it was a place that was a you know, reasonably sized town that had a future to it, but then the war came along and made it into a, a really important um, city in the South and in the Confederacy. And then it's a place that gets destroyed. Uh, other places were destroyed, certainly during the war, but Atlanta was, uh, you know, was partially burned by the Confederates when they um, retreated in September 1864, and then it was burned again by Sherman when he left the city in uh, November 1864. So, it, um, so that's all makes it sort of an interesting part for civil war, interesting place for the civil war historians. But it's also a place that defined itself after the war by. Um, destruction and its um, its position in the war, its position in the Atlanta campaign, and uh, and its identity as a city very much uh, became wrapped up with the South's identity. So that to me that's very interesting, the uh, connections between how the South saw itself and how the South um, tried to redefine itself. Uh, Atlanta's quite at the cutting edge, sort of at the cutting edge of, of what's going on there, dy the dynamic of what's going on there with the South. So it all makes an interesting story. I start with the war and um, the Civil War, and I end with the Atlanta, the famous Atlanta riot of 1906. So I look at a fairly large span of time, 40 years, more than 40-year time span, and look at um, the debate that took place, really, about what the war meant. So in a sense, the book is, is about the war, but it's also about how, what the Civil War meant and how people differ in their definition of it. I know that you've already touched on this briefly, but what was really the Civil War experience in the city of Atlanta? I think everybody has heard of the name William Tecumseh Sherman, but there's there's so much more involved, really, in, in the history of this city during the war itself. Well, there's 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 kind of a home front story that I've talked about already a little bit the the uh, expansion of of Atlanta as a vital transportation and manufacturing hospital center for the Confederacy. And uh, the very interesting story of the, of the, of the military struggle of, uh, for the conquest of Atlanta, Sherman um, invaded northern Georgia in uh, the spring of 1864 and waged this terrifically uh, arduous campaign through the hills of northern Georgia, uh, basically from Chattanooga, Tennessee, Georgia line down through this a really rough terrain, um, ultimately laying siege to Atlanta, besieging Atlanta in the summer, late summer, 1864. And that campaign was, uh, to me, very, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's intriguing because of its unrelenting nature, it, it, uh, it, the, the way that the warfare was practiced and the way that the warfare was experienced by both sides is very interesting. And as well, of course, the the Camp Atlanta campaign is, is rightly remembered, I think, as one of the crucial moments in the history of the Civil War and kind of linked to the re-election of Lincoln in, in November. Um, so in a lot of ways, it's a really pivotal moment in the war itself, and uh, as well as in the history of Atlanta, really more broadly in the whole history of the Civil War. And in the war's aftermath, as the decisions are being made to, to rebuild this city and to really rebuild an identity for it, um, you point out, and I, I wonder if you could elaborate on it further, kind of the unique role, kind of the confluence of groups that begin to congregate in Atlanta in the post-war period and how that really shapes, in a sense, it, its post-war um, reputation and identity. 
Well, Atlanta um, basically doesn't exist as a place before the mid 1840s. So it's a it's a very much a new place, and it's filled with um, a class of entrepreneurs who are very determined to build the place up, um, and who uh, want to create a kind of memory. I think. Um, so there, the the well, one thing that's interesting about Atlanta is it does have a large number of Northerners um, who uh, are in the city in the antebellum period and are there a new group really in many ways in the um, the post war period. Um, it has uh, as well, I think, a very interesting African American um, community. Um, interestingly, Atlanta is a place that largely excluded Black people before the Civil War. There were very few free Blacks, for example. And relatively few slaves, um, but the black population grows very uh, grows significantly during the war because of the labor demands of the war, overheated war economy. And um, during uh, a period, the Reconstruction period, when um, emancipation occurred and when there was so much uncertainty about what uh, uh, the rights of free people would be and what their position in society would be, when violence became uh, endemic uh, across the Georgia countryside and much of the rural South, Atlanta becomes a kind of enclave uh, because of the federal occupation and the federal presence that remained in the city um, well after the Civil War. So, um, and there are other reasons as well that this sort of black community grows and uh, becomes a base in, in a way for uh, black leadership. Um, one other important factor certainly was this kind of enclave of Northern abolitionists that came to Atlanta right after the Civil War and uh, American Missionary Association teachers founded black schools and eventually founded Atlanta University. And Atlanta University becomes a big center, it seems to me, of black leadership all over the South. Uh, and uh, it's a place that's um, integrated as well, which, of course, is sort of very, very unusual for the late 19th century South. So Atlanta has kind of a mixture, and really the, the um, it feeds into sort of this dialogue that you have about what um, what the past of the South was and what the future of the South should be, and um, in a way, a kind of ongoing con contestation that took place uh, between people, particularly white people and black people, about what the Civil War meant and what the past of the war was, the meaning, what the meaning of the war was for the future as well. And I think you you put it well in the book. You kind of position Atlanta as in some sense, a, a typical southern city in the war's aftermath, while at the same time trying to almost broker a new future, to break a new mold. And, and it's got a very unique position uh, as a southern city in that regard. Yes, I think so. I think it, um, Atlanta was very conscious that it was leading the future for the South. So it was a place that was self-consciously modern, it was an urban place. It was a place that was self-consciously um, adopting things like manufacturing and things like uh, railroads, of course, the Great Railroad, Railroad Center. Um, the New South, what people start to call the New South, this in many ways kind of social construction that appears in the 1880s. Atlanta is really the center of what that movement was. Henry Grady, who was longtime editor of the Atlanta Constitution, uh, and uh, a publicist, in many ways, for the New South. He gives his famous speech in December 1886 in New York City, where he explains to a Yankee audience about how the South has changed and how it's adopting industrialization, how it's adopting manufacturing, how it's turned its back on a past of slavery and slaveholding and agriculture in the old style, and is looking forward to a new movement of... Uh, of development, industrialization, and also sex sectional reconciliation with the North. Brady uh, is probably the best example that we have of um, a New South kind of booster of the late 19th century. So uh, Atlanta sees itself really kind of the, the cutting edge of what the South wants to be. And it's very much image making. It's very, very much um, marketing in many ways because, you know, people like Brady were selling a product and the product was... Um, was uh, a South where the North could invest, in which the North could invest, in which Northern capitalists could invest. Um, uh, so Atlanta doesn't see itself as out of the mainstream in terms of the South. Um, whether it was typical of the South, um, 
you know, the average Southerner doesn't live in a place like Atlanta, certainly in the late 19th century, but it sees itself as at the cutting edge of kind of the leadership of what the South ought to be. And I wonder, how do you, would you characterize this book? It, it fits so many molds. It's at, at times, it's, it's a memory study. At times, it's uh, a study of the Civil War. Uh, and it's also Southern history. Is it really just kind of a, a confluence of all these different things in your mind? If you had to kind of explain it to somebody, what this book really is? Is it urban history? I mean, how would you define it? Or is it just all the above? Um, I think it's mainly about the New South. Yeah, it, and that's um, what uh, what I was trying to do really in the book was sort of connect the uh, this moment in the history of the South when the South began to redefine it as itself as the New South with the Civil War. It seems to me the Civil War is instrumental in that, that you wouldn't have had a New South. I mean, that, that may be sort of uh, commonsensical, but in many ways it isn't, I think. People try to understand the New South, they sometimes divorce it from this context of uh, destruction and memory. Um, so, and I, I wanted to do a memory study, but I didn't want to do it in the way that it has been done, which in many ways is sort of decontextualized. The memory have often looked at the words and looked at language um, in large part out of the context of how the words were produced. So uh, the advantage of looking at a place like Atlanta is, A, it's a very significant place. I mean, few people studying the South would say this is not a very would say it's not an interesting place or an important place. It is, and uh, and looking at one place, you have a chance to to find context. So I, I see that as an important component of unraveling what the war meant to people and how it affected you know this huge, traumatically destructive war um, shaped how a community evolved and how it loomed large, really for at least a generation, certainly more, you know, until 1906, it's really sort of the war, the aftermath of the war, the way people remember it shapes a whole lot of different things, but Atlanta sort of shapes how, how the city develops. Now, you wear many hats down at the University of Florida, and, and you are, aside from being an author, you're also in the classroom. And, and I wonder, when you get around to teaching the Civil War, be it to undergraduates or, or to graduate students, um, is there anything that you really try, and, and I realize this is probably a, a difficult question to kind of answer succinctly, but is there something that you try and emphasize with your students about the war or the war era, a big takeaway for them? Well, I think it's, uh, it's very easy to kind of put the Civil War in a box, to see it in terms of a series of battles, which it was, and to see it in terms of um, the military strategy, which is very important. Um, but I try to emphasize the larger significance of what the war meant. I mean, that's maybe what attracted me to this topic was thinking about the war in a larger context. So when I teach the war, I like to talk about, um, about how the war affected people, how the war, um, changed things to the extent to which it changed things. So, um, at the same time, I'm not one of those people that's not interested in military history. I was sort of raised on it, like a lot of people, that's what drew me into it. And I think the key thing is to get students enthused about something, and um, but then also is to kind of subvert what their, their thinking is. I mean, that sounds like a perverse way of teaching, but really good teaching, it seems to me, involves getting students to think about something they thought they know about in a different way. So the war um, is filled with so many dimensions to it that people haven't considered, it seems to me. I mean, there's such a wonderful literature out there about the Civil War that sort of exemplifies that, you know, um, and a much more complex literature, really, that, than the ordinary narratives have, or the usual narratives have about the war. So, now, I don't know if that, yeah. Mentioning I mean, that literature, has there been uh, a work as of late that's really stuck out to you uh, as, as kind of really, just really grabbing your attention, I guess? Uh, well, I think Stephanie McCurry's book is really a very new take on, um, on the war and what the war meant. Um, that's, you know, among the books that have been published in the, the past few years. Um, there is such narrative power in the war that you hate to lose it. I, that's one of the things about my book. I said, um, um, it's one of the difficult things was combining uh, an understanding of the military situation with an understanding of other things which are really very non-military. But there's power. The narrative power lies in the, 
the sort of linear progression that you have in, in war. And um, I've always been a fan of straight narrative history. I mean, I shouldn't say that, I guess, as a historian, but I, I loved to read the stuff, and as a kid, I read the stuff. So, um, you know, the old classics like Shelby Foote and uh, Bruce Catton, even, dare I say. Uh, you know, great stuff. And you, can re you can read it and reread it. There's just so much there. Well, fair enough, Dr. Link. Well, I appreciate you taking some time out of your day. Again, the book is Atlanta, Cradle of the New South, uh, out with UNC Press now. Um, I recommend people pick it up. It's a great look into the city of Atlanta. And uh, even for people that are wary of, of treading into the post-war period, I would highly recommend it because uh, it gives you some great context and understanding, uh, as Dr. Ling, as you say, this kind of the emergence of the New South. And, and Atlanta's pivotal role in all of that. So um, a very good read, something I'd recommend. Uh, and thank you so much for coming on, Dr. Link, and uh, hopefully we can have you on again soon. Okay, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.